Acute rheumatic fever develops due to autoimmune response to pharyngitis, caused by a group A streptococcus. The concept is that initially group A streptococcus cause pharyngitis. In response to streptococcus, B cells produce antibodies. Antibodies bind to streptococcus, but also antibodies bind to glycoproteins in the tissues. And antibodies in tissues cause severe inflammation that results in tissue injury, and tissue injury manifests with clinical symptoms. In acute rheumatic fever, there are four major targets – it's heart, joints, brain, and skin. So let's explain the pathogenesis. Here we have pharyngeal epithelium, and sometimes streptococcus can penetrate into pharyngeal epithelium where it causes inflammation. And we call this condition pharyngitis. But from pharyngeal epithelium, streptococcus can leak into the blood. And it's quite dangerous because in the blood streptococcus produce streptolysin O, which is basically toxin. It's quite an aggressive substance that can cause damage to tissues. At the same time, antigen-presenting cells phagocyte some streptococcus organisms and present small particles of streptococcus on MHC2 receptors to T helpers. The logic is that antigen-presenting cells want to know – is streptococcus normal material or it's something pathogenic? T helpers scan particles and in normal condition T helper do not recognize particles as antigen and thereby there will be no inflammation. You know, they think it's a product of streptococcus, nothing to be worried about, common situation. But some people have MHC2 receptors that are produced based on HLA-DR7 alls, and in this case, most probably, inflammation will develop. And to understand why, we have to know how antigen presentation occurs. In normal condition, when streptococcus enters into the organism, macrophage intakes streptococcus in order to present this organism to T helper. And antigen presentation occurs by an MHC2 receptor. What we have to know about MHC2 receptor is that it's a protein. And the genetic information that tells us how to make MHC2 receptor is contained in the gene that is located on chromosome 6 and we call this gene HLA-DR gene. But we have different variations of HLA-DR genes, and such variations we call alls. The simplest analogy is the eye color. You see, we all have genes that encodes the color of our eyes. But some of us have blue eyes, and some of us have black eyes. And in this case, genes that encodes blue eyes we call blue all, and genes that encodes black eyes, black all. So we all have genes that encodes eye color, but this gene can be different. And different variations, which are blue and black colors, of the same gene that in this case encodes eyes, we call alls. So in case of acute rheumatic fever, we all have gene that encodes MHC2 receptor. We call this gene HLA-DR gene. But this gene can be different. And different variations of HLA-DR gene we call HLA-DR alls. For example, if person has HLA-DR1 alls, this person will have MHC2 receptor that was made based on genetic information in HLA-DR1 alls. And such MHC2 receptor presents particle in a perfectly normal way. And when T helpers income to this receptor, they recognize this particle as a normal substance, and because of this, they do not see any danger. If person has HLA-DR3 allele, this person will have MHC2 receptor that was made based on genetic information in HLA-DR3 allele. And such MHC2 receptor presents particle also in a perfectly normal way. Thereby, there will be no inflammatory response. If person has HLA-DR6 allele, this person will have MHC2 receptor that was made based on genetic information in HLA-DR6 all, and such MHC2 receptor also presents particle in a perfectly normal way, so there will be no inflammatory response. But some individuals have HLA-DR7 all, thereby in this person we will have MHC2 receptor that was made based on genetic information in HLA-DR7 all.
The problem is that this particular MHC2 receptor do not know how to present particles to T-helpers. When T-helper income to MHC2 receptor, in this case, because this particle is presented in abnormal way, they cannot recognize particle, and thereby they think that it's antigen. In response to any antigen, T-helpers immediately becomes activated and subsequently they activate B lymphocytes that begin to produce antibodies. So in individuals that have HLA-DR7 allele, MHC2 receptor presents particles in abnormal way, and because of this, T helpers recognize streptococcus particles as antigen, and in response to antigen, T helpers becomes activated. Once T helper becomes activated, T helper activates B lymphocytes. And with activation, B lymphocytes begin to produce antibodies against everything which is related to streptococcus. First of all, they begin to produce antibodies against streptolysin O. We call them ASLO or anti streptolysin O antibodies. And also, they produce antibodies against streptococcus itself. We call them anti-streptococcal antibodies. Massive production of antibodies cause inflammatory state. And with inflammation, white blood cells increase, C-reactive protein increase, and erythrocyte sedimentation rate increase. But it's not the major problem. The most significant problem is that there is a chance that these antibodies will not only bind to streptococcus, but also to glycoproteins or receptors on our tissues. The concept is that antibodies can also mistakenly bind to glycoproteins or to receptors on our tissues. The phenomenon when antibodies would recognize our normal receptors as something related to streptococcus we call molecular mimicry. Basically, in these circumstances, for them glycoproteins or receptors can look exactly like streptococcus, and this creates a huge problem. In the heart, antibodies can cause carditis, and the most common complication of carditis is mitral valve injury. It can be stenosis of the mitral valve, or it can be regurgitation. To explain this, here we have mitral valve. Mitral valve on its surface has laminin and other glycoproteins. When our organism begins to produce antistreptococcal antibodies, they mistakenly bind to laminin or other glycoproteins, and with binding, antibodies trigger the release of vascular cell adhesion molecule 1 into the surface of the valve. So, as a result, we have a lot of activated FCAM1 molecules on the surface of the valve. When this happens, T killers and T helpers bind to FCAM1 molecules, and with binding, they penetrate into the tissue. Inside the mitral valve tissue, activated T helpers trigger activation of macrophages. And activated T helpers with activated macrophages inside the endocardium form so-called usher of bodies, which is a signature feature of acute rheumatic fever. Activated T helpers and macrophages cause inflammation. If it's acute CV inflammation, it causes disruption of the mitral valve structure and this will cause mitral regurgitation. And if it's a chronic type of inflammation, then calcium begins to progressively deposit on mitral valve surface, and calcification of the mitral valve will cause mitral stenosis. So acute rheumatic fever can cause both. On this image, we can see a lot of CAM1 molecules on the surface of the valve. As a result, white blood cells from the blood bind to FCAM1 molecules and penetrate into the tissue, and inside the tissue they cause inflammation. On the second image, we can see usher bodies, which are T-helpers mixed with macrophages. Also, carditis can cause fibrosis in the conduction system, and typically this manifests as prolongation of PR interval on ECG. The second target of antibodies are joints, where antibodies cause arthritis. It can be mono or polyarthritis. So, how arthritis develops? So, in the joint we have cartilage and bone tissue, and also around the joint we have synovium. Antistreptococcal antibodies bind some complement components, and this results in formation of immune complexes.
immune complexes are very reactive substances, and immune complexes can deposit on synovium where they cause synovitis, or immune complexes can bind to collagen on cartilage surface, and with binding, antibodies induce inflammation of the cartilage. Inflammation of the cartilage and synovium we call arthritis, which is in this case can affect just one joint, we call this monoarthritis, or it can affect multiple joints, and this condition we call polyarthritis. The third target for antibodies is brain tissue, where antibodies cause Sydenham's chorea. So how brain injury develops? Here we have a basal ganglia, where we have two neurons that form synapse. On the surface of the neurons, we have Eliza gangliosides, which are the structural components of the neuron, and also we have dopamine receptors. To send a signal from one neuron to the other, we have to make a neurotransmitter. In this case, it's dopamine. We make dopamine from phenylalanine, and the essential enzyme that catalyzes conversion of phenylalanine to dopamine called tyrosine kinase. Once we make dopamine, we secrete dopamine into the synapse, where dopamine binds to dopamine receptors on the second neuron, and this causes activation of the second neuron that results in movements. But what happens in acute rheumatic fever? Antistreptococcal antibodies bind to lysogangliosides, or they bind to dopamine receptors. With binding, they induce activation of calcium calmodulin-dependent protein kinase 2. And activation of kinase stimulates the function of tyrosine kinase. If tyrosine kinase becomes more active, then we will produce more dopamine. And the higher the dopamine production, the higher will be dopamine secretion. And thereby, the stronger will be the stimulation of dopamine receptors. This results in hyperactivation of neurons that significantly increase movements. And rapid, uncontrolled muscle movements cause chorea. We call this Sydenham's chorea. On this image, we can see antibodies against streptococcus in brain tissue. As we see, antibodies due to the staining have a brighter color. And the last target of antibodies is skin, and skin injury can manifest as erythema marginatum or as subcutaneous nodules. To explain this, here we have skin, Skin has three layers, it's epidermis, derma, and subcutaneous layer. On epidermis, we have carotene, which is one of the major structural components of the epidermis. Antistreptococcal antibodies bind to carotene and induce inflammation of the epidermis. And inflammation in epidermis manifests as erythema marginatum. But also antibodies can cross into subcutaneous layer, where they cause activation of T-helpers. With activation, T helpers induce activation of macrophages, and together, T helpers and multiple macrophages form granuloma, and such granulomas result in formation of subcutaneous nodules. Also, with inflammation, typically by the temperature increase, so fever develops, and inflammation in the joints typically cause pain, so arthralgia usually is also present. To make a diagnosis of acute rheumatic fever, we use John's criteria. And we have five major criteria. First of all, it's carditis, because we know that antibodies target heart tissue. The second criteria is arthritis, because antibodies target joints. The third criteria is chorea, because antibodies target brain tissue. And the last criteria is subcutaneous nodules and erythema marginatum because antibodies also affect skin. As a minor criteria, we have polyarthralgia, because inflammation of the joints commonly cause pain, fever, elevated erythrocyte sedimentation rate, and C-reactive protein are all signs of inflammation, because massive production of antibodies cause inflammatory state, and fever, elevated ESR, and C-reactive protein are all markers of inflammation. And the last minor criteria is prolonged PR interval, as a sign of carditis, because we know that antibodies target not only wells, but also they cause fibrosis in cardiac conduction system, and this manifests as prolongation of PR interval.
As we see, the only difference between low-risk and high-risk population is joint pain. In low-risk, there is pain in multiple joints, and in high-risk population, pain in just one joint is enough to fulfill the criteria. Also, we see that we have two types of antibodies, and usually, as a diagnostic method, we use antibodies to streptolysin O. We call them anti-streptolysin O antibodies. The major drug for prophylaxis of acute rheumatic fever is benzatine penicillin G. This drug kills streptococcus. Without streptococcus, there will be no streptolysin, and thereby there will be no substrates for antibodies production. And without antibodies, inflammation will not develop, and thereby tissues will be spared. So benzatine penicillin G is the first choice for prevention.